Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show um, every week as we are doing right now, and it will be available later for you to watch at your convenience. Um, both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch, so please do share um, with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested, excuse me, interested in any of the topics we have on Encompass Live. Um, for anyone who's not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries here in Nebraska, similar to your state library. So we provide services to all types of libraries in the state. So you will find shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries, public, academic, K-12 schools, um, corrections, museums, archives, historical societies, all sorts of things. Um, really our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries. Uh, we do book reviews, interviews, uh, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, all sorts of things. Uh, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes come on the show and talk about programs and services we're offering here through the commission. But we also bring in guest speakers, and that's what we have this morning. Um, this morning with us is uh, Laura England Biggs. Good morning, Laura. Good morning. And Linda McLean. Good morning, Linda. Good morning. And they are both from uh, Fremont, Nebraska. And um, the, I'm working with the Keene Memorial Library, who's been doing some uh, some major changes happening <laughs> uh, recently. And uh, this happened all during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, that we're in here. And they're still working on things. So um, they're going to tell us some uh, tips and tricks of, for fundraising during a pandemic and how it went, went in their library. So I'll hand it over to you, both Laura and Linda, to tell us all about it. Thank you, Krista. Uh, let's see here. We're going to go to talk about our expansion project background. Back in the 1980s, one of our local philanthropists left us a lot of money uh, to allow for an expansion. Wow. We needed to purchase a couple of houses next to the library's property. And she left a sunset provision uh, that the expansion needed to start by 2021. Wow. In 2004, our director at the time, Ann Stevens, commissioned the first of what were ending up being three space needs studies. Um, we worked with George Lawson, who has since retired, I believe, as a library planner. Our mm -hmm. third space needs study went to city council and we got approval to seek a $2 million bond vote, which was approved by 67% by the voters in 2018, back in May. So all of this happened before anything untoward. Um, the Keene Memorial Library, I'll give you a little background on the library itself, uh, was built in 1971. It replaced the Carnegie Library that was built in 1901. And it is named Keene Memorial Library because Hazel also gave the largest individual donation to the building of this, quote, new library in uh, 1969 to bring it up to date and more current. Uh, so we began fundraising. It was always intended to be an eight to ten million dollar project with mm -hmm. a two million dollar bond which we saw as a mandate, the voters said, do it. We tapped community leaders to become a fundraising committee and uh, they worked side by side with the current director at that time to set up some donor cultivation events. We hosted some at the library, some at folks' residences. The Friends of Keene Memorial Library put together a separate expansion fund at our Fremont Area Community Foundation, and a professional fundraiser was hired to assist with that process. No. Um, there was a steering committee put together. There was oh, any number of committees. I can't remember, three or four different committees. I worked at the library at that time, but I was only 
the assistant director slash youth services librarian. So I wasn't as involved at that point. And then, Linda, do you want to talk a little about our challenges? <laughs> um, sure. I, uh, so I'm Linda McLean, and I'm the um, president of the Key Memorial Library Board. Um, I'm also a liaison with the F Friends of Key Memorial Library Group. And at the time the bond was um, taken to the voters, I was actually a member of the Fremont City Council. And we took three different um, referendums to the voters that year, two of them, including this one passed. Um, as a city council member, I can say now looking back, we probably didn't ask enough questions at the time about how this deficit was going to be realized because as Laura said, this was always going to be an eight to $10 million project. And we really had with the bond, we, we didn't even have $4 million. So we were really like not even halfway there. And no one really said like, oh, well, what's your fundraising plan? Because the reality was, you know, we really didn't have one and the friends uh, were going to raise this money. However, the friends had really never raised this kind of money in the mm -hmm. past. And for any of you who've done fundraising at any level, you know how hard it is to raise money. So, um, you know, where Laura kind of left off, there was the hiring of a professional fundraiser, which, um, you know, while that can be, and, and I think it was at the time, everyone thought, oh, this is a really good idea because we need help. We don't know how to raise money. Um, unfortunately, if your fundraiser doesn't know your community, you're probably still going to have to rely on some local folks to really be your leaders. Mm -hmm. And um, when I got off city council, I kind of said, I'll go on the library board and I'll take some leadership of this process. Um, and and so that's kind of how I came into it. We did have the retention at that time of the professional fundraiser, uh, which we, we later did terminate that relationship. I'll let Laura kind of jump in here to talk about then how we how things got a little bit derailed along the way. Sure. Um, Folks probably remember 2019 was the year of historic flooding mm -hmm. in this area of the state. Fremont was an island for several days. Um, that is an actual picture from the newspaper showing uh, Ridgeland and Broad Street, and you can see the water is up to the houses. It came within eight blocks of the library, but the library was not affected. I remember that you were one of the ones that your library was one of the lucky ones, not necessarily staff people members. Right. Ones, but, uh, yeah, I all actually, of the way it was, that was, yes, devastating flooding. It was. I actually had been homesick that day that the flooding began in Omaha. And by the time I felt better, the waters had receded. So I missed most of the panic. Uh, <laughs> and I'm grateful for that. But the recovery efforts, the library served an important role helping folks get in touch with FEMA, get in touch with insurance agencies. So we got a little bit back on our feet. And then March 2020 happened. We were just relaunching our capital campaign in February with an event at the library. We brought in potential donors. We served wonderful food. Uh, and then March 7th, the community was informed that COVID had arrived and the library closed down for three months. Then our capital campaign chair and that director at the time both resigned at different times for different reasons. So we were a bit adrift. I was uh, appointed interim director and everything dropped in my lap. <laughs> so. Well, you, can imagine, you can imagine also that the last thing you want to be doing in a town, really in any town, but, you know, in a town the size of Fremont is to 
be pushing the library's fundraising agenda during the time when we're trying to raise money for flood victims and when we're trying to raise money for food security during COVID. So, I mean, necessarily we had to postpone really doing major fundraising simply because there were just too many other competing priorities in the community. Um, and again, then the staff change that Laura referred to, um, the leadership changes really set things back. So here we're now, you know, the bond was passed in May of 2018. Now we're 2019, 2020. We're you know, we're getting a bit out from, fortunately, there's no time limit on these bonds um, and their passage as to when they can be implemented, but um, mm -hmm. it, it's definitely been a challenging road from that passage of that bond. Mm -hmm. Perfect storm, <laughs> horrible things just happening yeah. all over. Yeah. I did mention that the, the Hazel Keene funds had a sunset. We did get the houses removed torn down whatever you want to call it uh before that sunset period because to be honest the hazel keen trust foundation didn't want the money back didn't want the houses back and so we got that accomplished moving ahead we regrouped we have grow with us was our campaign slogan this is grow with us 2.0 in april 20th of 2021 we held a fundraising dinner it was uh, invitation only to over 60 individuals in our excuse me, philanthropic community in Fremont. Uh, two of the members of the steering committee sponsored the dinner. We had 40 folks come, some wearing masks, some not. Uh, <laughs> the attendance was lower due to lingering COVID worries. <laughs> But we did net some donations and definitely sparked new interest in the library project. So it was it was a worthwhile kickoff. Um, what you see on the images are some renderings the architects had given us of what the new library would look like. Um, some of the colors, those were very popular with folks and we had a wonderful fly around video showing the exterior of the building just kind of on a loop then we started yeah, making I, I, the tough calls <laughs> um we we made that decision linda referred to to discontinue the relationship with the professional fundraiser in july of 2021 we found the outgo had not um kept pace with what we hoped would be coming in. We were spending more than we were getting out of the relationship. We do have wonderful pieces that were created by their graphic designer and we we thank them for that. That was a positive of that relationship. But we began the hard work on our own and the fundraising committee really looked um, morphed into Laura and Linda and <laughs> Denise Kai, the Friends Board President, will come in and review things with us and we sort of have her permission to apply on behalf of the Friends. I think that, um, again, tagging off what Laura was saying about the dinner, the, the cultivation event dinner that we had in April, um, the timing was was good, and we also um, had created, which is I think referenced in the next slide, but um, we had created a video which um, for anyone who is looking to raise money such as this, um, it's really important um, to tell your story and we had rolled out at that dinner our um, a video, a local videographer that we have here in Fremont, Vic Raider, he worked with us at a quite reduced uh, cost to create uh, about a five minute video that started sort of with the history of the library in Fremont, 
Um, it went through the needs, why we needed to do this, um, the age of our library, the ADA concerns, the technology infrastructure concerns. Um, so we were able to, and we, we did that pretty much on our own. We didn't have a professional uh, myself and Vic worked together on a script and we had the mayor involved and we had some board members involved. We had some people from the friends involved who kind of gave little testimonials. Laura was very integral in that video. So that was something that we were able to immediately put uh, up during, you know, and I think it was very effective. We were able to put it on um, our blog online and we were able to have people you know have a consistent um, way of viewing our story so to speak so um, I can't I guess underestimate the fact that I think that was a very um, important piece of um, media social media that we were able to create at a pretty low cost and, and we used it for quite a while during the campaign. Linda referred to an expansion project blog that we host. Um, I'm going to see if I can pull that up. Let's see if my computer behaves itself. <laughs> Hot dog. This is just a very simple done through WordPress. Um, site and then we have the announcement video here on YouTube. It's a lovely preview. <laughs> Let's see if I can skip the ad. No, it doesn't seem like I can just yet. <laughs> there it is. Now you can. There we go. We won't watch the whole thing, but we'll give you a taste. Can you turn up the volume on it? The sound's not really coming through. The gift of $15,000 from Andrew Carnegie, the first public library building on the corner of Military and Pack opened its doors. The original Carnegie Library served the Mount Well for almost 70 years, but Fremont had grown and needed a bigger library. A group of dedicated volunteers, including Hazel King, worked with the city of Fremont to design and construct the current King Memorial Library, which opened in 1971. While the King Memorial Library is um, an organization under the umbrella of the city, the library is the beneficiary of much philanthropy throughout its life. A longtime Fremont area philanthropist, uh, Hazel King, obviously played an important role in the life of this institution. Visitors to the King Memorial Library with its distinctive limestone exterior, grand staircase, Italian chandelier, and statue of a young girl called Louisa have many fond memories of time spent at the home. So I remember as a kid coming to the library and doing the story time. And I just remember sitting there and, and learning and, and listening and enjoying just the love of learning and knowledge. I have many fond memories of King Memorial Library. I worked with the summer reading program. And so my favorite summer reading program was Newly with Susan. All the children remembered me as Newly with Susan. Okay. I know we can go on, but uh, you <laughs> can, can watch it later. <laughs> watch it later. <laughs> right. Feel free to go and watch it at your, when, on your, yeah, yeah later when you, there we when go. you get the idea. Um, I'll, I'll mention the, while, while we're while we're showing how you clicked over to there to the, the blog and the video, um, as usual afterwards, um, everyone will have access to these slides, so you'll be able to get to everything um, that was mentioned here today. Absolutely. Uh, one of the biggest supports we have, as you saw, is our mayor, Joey Spellerberg, um, getting his family involved. If we could have watched it to the end, there's a really great piece where he and his three daughters and his wife say, won't you help us write the next chapter in our story? We rehearsed that several times. It was adorable. Um, we did participate in the Fremont Area Communi uh, Community Foundation Big Give 
And last year we made a little video you can see on our Facebook page with Linda and I and the Pink Panther theme and trench coats and oh, <laughs> it, it was fun. Um, on the slide, we'll do just about anything for money. Yes, we will. Anything for we'll like next year. You can see that we get great coverage on the Fremont Tribune uh, newspaper. They uh, they covered the first grant that we received from the foundation that really kicked off our fundraising. Um, we we utilize our our radio station, our newspaper. We put up on social media all the time. Um, so as I mentioned, we are the fundraising grant writing committee. We've written over 20 grants. 15 of them have been successful, but it has not always been easy, has it, my friend? Uh, no, it's, you know, it it is a journey and I, uh, liken it to a marathon. I, I am a former runner, a marathon. I've done two marathons and the last marathon I the last marathon I ran when I was at about mile 20 or 21, there's a picture that the photographers from the race took where my face looks like it's contorted in pain and my leg looks like it's at a weird angle. And I remember I didn't want to go on that day. <laughs> There's, there's times in this journey where it feels a little bit like that, where it's like we feel like we're in about mile 20 or 21 of a 26 mile race. Um, but we have um, come to the conclusion that we tell our story the best. We mm -hmm. uh, have used and leveraged these initial donor gifts, which anyone who is looking to do a major fundraising campaign I think it's critical that you get some initial uh, lead gifts. If you don't have lead gifts, you're really going to be at a disadvantage when you go to the foundations to ask for grants because in many cases, there will be a match required. Um, you, so you need to kind of know the amounts that are appropriate for you to be asking for and then uh, in some cases if your lead gift is a hundred thousand dollars for example as ours was from the Fremont Area Community Foundation that that might be the most then that you could apply for from some foundations because even though we have the bond at two million dollars the foundation might still say we want we will only match up to the amount of your largest single donor gift. Hmm. And so um, we had communication with a lot of foundations in the Omaha, greater Omaha area, um, regional area. We actually um, waited on our application uh, in one case uh, with the Kiwit Foundation, which uh, that is a public knowledge grant that we are we can talk about i think um because that was a case um, where it was a match involved and we were fortunate that one of our local businesses did whole stone farms stepped up with a five hundred thousand dollar lead gift early on in the campaign which uh, we were then able to um leverage with that foundation so it's really important to leverage those matches i can't i can't stress that enough and 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 try to have someone in your back pocket who is going to or are they are going to be your lead gifts yeah and those partnerships and leveraging them is something i always mention to our libraries too and you know we give out grants to libraries for various things um and sometimes we don't have a big budget to give to find the full amount that a library may have asked for. We'll do partial or something at least. And I always say, you can use this info though. You know, The library commission is supporting your project and that will help you to get grants from other places too. You know, I've, I've seen that where other grants have said, oh yeah, we see in our decision-making that this organization and this one and this one have already helped them out. They've got a good thing going and they're on a roll. Let's help as well. So it all kind of works um, together, yeah. Exactly. 
I do want to point out that the picture you see is Linda and myself at our September 27th groundbreaking. Ah. Our fundraiser reached the point where we were able to move Yay. forward with the project. It was very <laughs> exciting. I think Linda referred to our starting pot was about 3.5 million between trust funds, city funds, and the bond. At this point, we are sitting just shy of 7.6 million with a $10.7 million budget. So the fundraising continues. Um, when you're getting started with fundraising, we found it's very important to know your deadlines and work backward if you have to, to get pre-qualified for a letter of intent know whether you need to apply as a public entity versus a 501c3 and Linda's referred to making the right ask um, knowing what's a reasonable amount to ask for in one case we didn't ask for enough and we are going back to that organization to say hello we realized <laughs> that we perhaps under asked and we would like to kindly ask that you contribute again. Um, mm -hmm. We talked about levering, leveraging matches and getting that local support. Um, that has been crucial to getting some of the larger grants. Um, our and local always, take, always take pictures, right, Laura? Right. And we like we those big time pictures. pictures. Yes. The Fremont Area Community Foundation has the big check they love to run around with. Uh, we have the whole good, good impression, yeah. Yes. Uh, they chose to sponsor our computer lab. We were able to, with the support of Mayor Spellerberg, explain to them the importance of the computer lab in supporting their, their employees in becoming Mm -hmm. or fluent in English or Spanish or whatever language they need and in building the skills they need to be contributing members of society and better workers. So that was a win-win for both parties. And kind of to that point, um, earlier on, I can't remember when, Laura, was shortly after our initial event, we did come up with sort of a list of what we called commemorative naming opportunities. So we do have um, those available for donors to pursue, per, peruse, not pursue, per, peruse, and um, decide if maybe perhaps some, and those kind of range from $5,000 for a bench in the courtyard up to like $500,000 for the naming rights on the um, computer lab. I just recently watched uh, an ALA uh, webinar about fundraising on a much kind of larger scale, I guess so it was like the Philadelphia library or something, but it was really, interesting because they did say that for in order because this has come up before like how much would it take to get naming rights for the entire project so if we wanted to rename our library how much would you have to donate and mm -hmm. their um, take on that was you should it would be 30 percent of the total project before you would consider renaming so i i just throw that out there as an interesting fact that I learned in another training I was recently on because we had talked about that kind of in jest you know if someone walked in with a million dollar check would we rename our library the reality is probably not because again there's a lot tied into the name of our library with the Keene family um, but if you think about on a 10 million dollar project then that would you know mean they'd have to donate three million that kind of makes sense to me a little bit so just interesting thought food for thought some of the other uh, projects we've done as fundraising included challenging local businesses to help sponsor part of our summer reading program as a piece of the the capital campaign we got three businesses who each contributed a thousand dollars 
and received logos on the blog and mentions on our our social media um, we've approached the local banks and they've made charitable donations uh, we've got folks making required minimum distributions we've gotten donations from our local service clubs we're running a commemorative brick campaign what you see there is a single brick i did in honor of my mother Nice. who was the librarian that got me started. You can also do a double-sized brick, uh, and those are priced at $200 and $400. The price of the bricks is very low, so it's a, a it's not a great fundraiser, but it, it's something people can contribute if they can't give four figures. Um, and we tagged a lot in social media. I haven't figured out why I was standing on a tilt. I must have been wearing extra jewelry on my left side that day. <laughs> it's interesting. That's funny. <laughs> but that's the first state bank commitment to mm -hmm. us. They are naming the, um, I believe they are naming the children's room. No, the children's room is Kiwanis. First state bank is naming the children's library. I have too many things in my head. <laughs> yeah, well, once you get so many people, so many places supporting you, yeah. And that's yeah. that's a great thing. That's Offer them you know, put your name on something, and yeah, that'll definitely get people's attention. It's good PR for everybody. And I've got it all written down. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we have right now. I mean, we have a lot of. What was our list, Laura? We just sent another letter out. To, we sent a letter to um, people who previously donated and people who we still would like to donate. And our previous donation list is about 100 and 125 ish. Yeah. Right. And the total mailing was around 230, I think. So we've netted over $2,000 in responses. So it was worth doing that mailing. Uh, we just oh, no. you keep have to keep plugging away at end of the year and it's... I've gotten several phone calls from the foundation folks with how long can they stretch their donation out and what are your levels again and so those make me think very positively about what's happening based on our work um, folks are are looking to larger donations which we welcome anytime. <laughs> when you're trying to get your foot in the door, there's a lot of tips we came up with there. Um, mm. Linda has really been instrumental in making our applications in our own voice. Um, the, the fundraiser used flowery language and I don't even recognize what library they're talking about half the time. Linda helped us bring it down to, hi, here's who we are, here's what we need, and here's the statistics that help support it without saying here's the statistics that help support it. <laughs> <laughs> it does, it, 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 what you mentioned earlier, Linda, that it's important that whoever you are hiring to do something with, with you like this yet knows your community, knows your library, understands, you know, not just, I mean, you said professional fundraiser, okay but in what right can, can they really yeah can they really effectively tell your story you know i um i think that laura and i actually are more you know we bring a personal passion to it that oh, that makes a huge difference yes it's hard you know i i grew up and the first fundraiser we did i spoke about just the importance, I didn't grow up in Fremont, but I grew up going to the library a lot and I'm an avid reader. I still have a book that I won as the third prize in the 1969 reading con summer reading contest in my hometown. And, you know, um, I have a love of reading. Reading it has sustained me through times in my life when you know i was lonely or sad or depressed or whatever you know it's something that i turn to as 
I mean, I mean, I'm just so glad that I love to read because I feel like it's such an important thing. And what we provide at the library to people is more than, you know, it's, it's access, it's, um, you know, just being able to, to get education and, and seek knowledge, like Joey said in the video. So I, I am, don't get me going, because I'm like super passionate about it. <laughs> um, but that, that shows to people, and people don't always think of, they think, oh, well, I haven't gone to the library in years, you know, and they're not thinking like, oh, well, if you can't afford Wi-Fi, like, more than 20% of the people in Fremont, you know, how do you get your Wi-Fi? How do your kids use, get their homework done? I mean, you go to the library, that's your point of access for knowledge, education, learning. So, you know, it, it is very important in a community like Fremont, like, like any community. It's one of the few free places out there where you can truly just go and access information. So um, you have to tell the story in your own voice. You have to use, you can't talk about, you know, institution, blah, 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 you know, some of this, the lingo, it's flowery. And I really encourage you, if you're going through a grant application, answer the question. You know, if they list five questions they want you to answer, boom, 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 answer them in order. If they say there's a 500 word limit, you don't have to give them 500 words if you can answer the question in 150 words, so. Yeah. Well, yep. Uh, yep. Right, we found using standard fonts for those that are not online applications, uh, using our paragraph breaks to give the ease of the flow and write for eighth grade or lower. It's not that these folks don't have the education, but you're not trying to impress someone and get a doctorate here. You're trying to get some money. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's and, what it, the story is. Yeah, you explain exactly what you're doing, why you're doing, the impact it will have. I mean, it is, and like you said, like, like I think Laurie said, Linda made it easy to understand and read. Don't be like, like you said, flowery and just, if it's not specific but, enough to I mean, be specific. But Linda, uh, Linda couldn't do the technical part that Laura can do. So <laughs> you need Laura, to both kinds of skills, all kinds of skills. Laura, so. Laura can move things around from two screens and she can cut and paste and she can make PDFs. And so Linda can't do all those things. So it truly is a team effort. And she also keeps all the numbers, which, you know, my career was in HR for you know, my whole life. And I always said, if I was good at math, I wouldn't have gone into HR. So um, <laughs> I'm not really the spreadsheet guru, uh, but Laura, it, like I said, it works as a good team effort. It, it really does. We have a good relationship. We've built lots of good relationships. We've worked one of those relationships into a six figure gift over a year and a half. Another one we kept working is another six-figure gift. Both of them are anonymous and um, you won't be seeing press releases, but it's significant. So we maintained contact persistent, but not pushy, and just sent them updates and eventually were invited to apply. So that was, that was one of our, our big learnings was if you have an email address for someone and you have some kind of a personal relationship, don't be afraid to use it strategically. Right. You just don't want to bombard people with, you know, you, you, like I said, you want to be strategic. Like Laura said about, we would, you know, we would send, um, I had a particular relationship and I think there's an example, which you probably can't read. Uh, on a uh, page there, but I mean, I would just kind of periodically send an email and say, you know, I would even say, hey, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to be pushy, but I want to let you know what's going on because this is an exciting project for Fremont. This is what we're doing. This is how much money we've raised. You know, as always, I appreciate you and your interest in Key Memorial Library. Um, 
you know, let us know if there's a chance to apply for funds from your foundation. Um, you know, so eventually these, you know, they don't all work out, but as Laura mentioned at the beginning, I think we've applied for like 20 foundation grants and we have received funding on about 15 of them. So we have a fairly good track record and success does breed success. It does, you know, the more you raise, the easier I think it becomes in a way to, you know, to leverage that for future gifts. Um, but as she said, we're still, you know, costs have gone up and we're still um, in an active fundraising mode. Uh, we hope that we'll be able to, we've got a couple big grants on the radar in the first part, first quarter of next year that we hope will take us uh, quite a bit closer and we appreciate the city's confidence in what we've done and what we're doing. And that brings us to the next slide of staying on their radar where you need to know your timing again. It's important to know what's their fiscal year, what's their grant cycle, when is all of this due? Some urgency can get their attention. And if you can connect your request with their interest, maybe they really focus on education, maybe they focus on early childhood, maybe they focus on technology. You can look at their websites and news articles. You can also research in the foundation resource directory from nebraskachildren.org. I've gone through and highlighted another 15 or 20 places we might tap. It may not be huge gifts, but it's going to be potential gifts that will go towards the final result. Sometimes it does have to be a whole bunch of little things, little funders like that. There's not, there might not be the the one grant that covers everything. The one thing it's 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 got to be for something so large as what you're doing. Unless you right. get some some yeah. millionaire who does want a billionaire <laughs> to give you all that money. Um, and, you know, if, yeah. If, if a billionaire wants to come along and give us a few million, we're fine with that. Yes, that's true. <laughs> yes. I think our our largest gift to date is $750,000 and our smallest grant from a foundation is a thousand or 2000. Yes. Something like that. So I we, mean, there's a wide range yeah, there. Yeah. We have over 60 donors who've given from 25 to a thousand dollars. Just, we don't track those. I don't track anything under a thousand separately, but I know there's like 62 individuals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll and we also highly five. recommend that foundation resource directory too. And and think outside the box, like you were saying, Laura, like focusing on if someone, said, if an organization says we're into our, uh, education, look for things that are not just for libraries. There are grants for um, nonprofits or grants for municipalities or grants for, um, I don't know. You just gotta you know, just think about what does a library do, and and just don't just search it for a library because you'll limit yourself so many times. They don't necessarily mention the word library in what they do or who they fund, but you do fall into the categories of what they are interested in supporting. And so you know, look at the ones you wouldn't necessarily think about. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. This is the slide that Linda was talking about with the email to our our contact that she, um, worked, literally worked for <laughs> over a year. Uh, this is just one of those touch base notes. Um, mm -hmm. longer messages sometimes work better, but it doesn't mean to be flowery and unnecessary that you're an institutional hub and pillar of society. Um, okay. There's a book I read, which is referenced in a couple of slides, I think, that really said, you, you write a paragraph, you make your ask, you write a paragraph, you make your ask, you write a paragraph, and you repeat your ask at the close. And people are going to skim, and they're going to find your ask popping out to them. So that was the thought there. Right. And again, as Laura said before, um, you know, why why is your request urgent right now? Well, now we're actually, you know, we're in a point where we're saying, hey, it's urgent because we need to finish the project. <laughs> but, 
Right. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's urgent because we have this time frame because the bond passed four years ago because, you know, our building is not ADA compliant. It's not mm -hmm. uh, easily accessible to all. It, you know, our technology infrastructure is tapped out. We can't continue forward without these improvements. You know, you've got to, you know, communicate why it's important that we're doing this right now. We're not just doing this because we don't like our old library. We we do, but we need to do this to keep pace with what's happening. And every 51 year old building needs to be updated, right? Oh, I mean, yes. at, oh, at our age, we all could use a little work. So yeah. um. <laughs> I feel called out here. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we found that the uh, grammar and punctuation make a difference. Proofread, proofread, proofread. Have someone else read it and tell you what they think. Mm -hmm. Make sure your numbers are consistent. That has been the biggest pain in my rear, but my spreadsheets, I finally have one that I trust and I just marked all the rest of them do not use. <laughs> Make sure you answer all of their questions. If you can't answer it, for instance, tell them why you can't. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the questions was, what's your pro forma budget for the next five years? Well, the city doesn't budget like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't know yet but when i have one i will deliver it <laughs> um and we make it about the donor not about us we give them a clear call to action tell them what they can do we've talked about the commemorative naming opportunities we need to know if the grantor wants that public recognition some want to have the name on the room some just want the name on the wall and some you acknowledge without telling how much they gave. There are several examples of donor walls we've seen. The size of the name indicates the amount given, but nobody knows what that amount was. Mm. Sure. And some donors yeah, we, want that, don't want people to know exactly, and that's perfectly fine. Right. Yeah. And it is kind of tacky if you think about it to like put the amount. I don't know. I I kind of we we did um visit was it the Crete Library? They have a beautiful yes. new library in Crete. Oh yep yep. And uh, they have a beautiful donor wall also. It's and it's there's no amount. It's just mm -hmm. you know lovely pieces of wood in different sizes. So um, I I think that also works well into the future. Um, yeah. You know, when we look at our original donor plaque wall from Key Memorial Library, which we're preserving and going to be using in the genealogy conference room, uh, mm -hmm. it didn't have any amounts on it. It just had a list of, you know, kind of the key donors. So um, I, I think that idea, I know other places where they've had to adapt their walls because as people give more, then they change. And so in a way, it's kind of nice to not attach those dollar amounts, just using the size of um, the plaques to to denote sort of a, a general size of donation. So We also believe you can't say thank you enough. Yeah letters that we send out. We have one version you see here from the friends. We have one version from the library. Both of those have the tax information at the bottom because the municipal, uh, well, the city as a municipality is also something where you can give to the city and it's tax exempt based on mm -hmm. different language than what you see there for the 501c3. We've sent holiday cards to folks at the end of the year, just thanking them. We've had an individual sponsor those. We're having the friends sponsor them this year. We follow up in person with folks. We do recognition at our events and make sure that we just say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm rushing a little because I have a, a 11:15 appointment at Head Start to read to the kids. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm a little late, it's no big deal. Uh, we use professional yeah, just, pieces. Mm -hmm. 
Um, these were the invitations to our Dine and Discover dinner. This is part of what we got from the professional fundraising folks mm -hmm. was some really beautiful pieces that we the could use. Work. Yes, it's very uh, definitely eye-catching. Yeah, it's nicely done. They worked with the color scheme that we wanted. The case study we're still using. We just print our own now as we need them. Um, there's we simplified our original letter of intent on the left is very complicated on the right we made it how much would you like to give us and how long would you like to take to pay it <laughs> and it really it is a lot easier mm -hmm. um, our groundbreaking ceremony was a different uh, designer but still beautiful mm -hmm. we're very grateful to uh, one of our friends board members who's got a staff member who does graphic design and put this together on very short notice for us yeah if this you can find someone to volunteer to do some graphic design for you that's a really that's a great um, in-kind donation for sure absolutely this is the book i read it's a short read 33.95 on Amazon. It's the fundraiser's guide to irresistible communications, real world field tested strategies for raising more money. Nice. <laughs> and it's it it took me, I don't know, three hours maybe to go through it. I I just I worked my way through in breaks and things and picked up some good tips. So I highly recommend it to folks. I've given it to our uh our city's grant coordinator to read because she said, well, if you're getting good ideas, maybe I should read it. <laughs> and we're on the question screen, yay. <laughs> I didn't put Linda's information up here, but if you want to talk to her, I can connect you. <laughs> sure, sure. I just didn't want to have people from across the country calling her at odd hours. <laughs> No problem. Awesome. Well, that was great. And almost perfectly on time. It's like only 11.01. We did start a little late. Fine. Um, thank you so much, Laura and Linda. Does anybody have any questions you want to ask right now? As Laura said, she just have a, a reading thing to get to with Head Start, so we don't want to make sure she gets there in time for the, for the children. Um, but does anybody have any desperate questions you want to ask them? Go ahead and type into your question section. Uh, nobody typed anything while you were talking. That's okay. Wow. We've got some thank yous coming through. Thanks a lot. Um, a good, good question. I have one. One last thing is when um, when will the you did the groundbreaking the groundbreaking in September? When is the pro proposed end date of when it will all be done? And ah. we have a date. <laughs> well. <clears throat> At the moment, we're working through some little hiccups. We had some abatement issues, but if everything goes according to schedule, there is the potential that we move back in in November 2023 and reopen in December. Only about a year, not bad. Okay. And right. that's all subject to change, of course. Of course. Weather, <laughs> supply chain, and whatever. All but the that is, suspects, that yeah. is the last estimate. Nice. Okay. So I know you're in a temporary location now in the city auditorium, and that's great. You're still running. The library is still available during this. Yes, it is. It's in a different spot. We have that's six computers instead of 15, but that's okay. We still have printing. We still have internet. We still have books, mm -hmm. lots of books. <laughs> It's really pretty amazing. Yeah, if you're in Fremont, uh, or we call it affectionately the librarium, the <laughs> library auditorium, um, it is actually very nice. The feedback's been really, really great. And we, we worked through some, um, you know, issues with the parks and recreation department here to make this happen. Again, a really good partnership um it it takes a village really to do this you know yeah. mm -hmm. absolutely um well that's good yeah obviously i'm sure that yeah the community knows this is a temporary situation um we're still we're offering the services that we can and we'll see you in, in in about a year and everything will be back and wonderful again yeah that's right awesome well it doesn't look like anybody has any questions now that's fine 
you all have Laura's contact info there. You can reach out to her um, if you do have any questions you want to ask. Um, so thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Linda and Laura. This is great. Um, I've been wanting to know how things were going because I've been, you know, we, we, of course, we keep an eye on things going on in our libraries here in Nebraska and mm -hmm. seeing how it was progressing. So I was glad to see a nice kind of wrap up here. Um, and maybe when you do reopen in a year or something, you can um, come back and talk about what did happen over the, since the last time and how what wonderful things popped up out of the blue that we had to deal with <laughs> after <laughs> between groundbreaking and when everything was done because um, it should be an interesting year for for everyone there. <laughs> yes, it absolutely. Should. Yes, if anyone uh, is looking at moving out of their library temporarily, I recommend they speak with Laura because. <laughs> That was a project um, yeah. in its own, I'm sure. Yes, it was. That's a whole um, other Encompass Live. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that. We'll, we'll talk to you next <laughs> year about that. All right, I'm going to pull presenter control back to my screen okay. now and do my wrap up here for today's show. There we go. So, thank you everybody for being here. Thank you, Laura and Linda. Um, this, uh, as I said, this is recorded. If you go to our main Encompass Live page, we have our upcoming shows here, and then underneath those is a link to our archives. Most recent one will be at the top. So today's show will be up there. I should have it done um, and posted by the end of the day tomorrow. Um, we do post our recordings to our YouTube channel for everyone to watch, um, and the slides will be available well. Uh, Laura, you can send those to me as, whenever you get a chance um, between today and tomorrow. Everyone who attended today's show and registered today's show will get an email from me letting you know when the recording is ready um, and available here on our page. We also post out to our uh, various social media. You'll notice on our Encompass Live page on HR session page, we have a link here to our Facebook page. Um, we do a Facebook page for Encompass Live. We do reminders, just a reminder to log in today's show, meet our speakers. Um, so we will post on here when the recording is available. Here is last week's. Uh, and on to Twitter and Instagram, we post things there. Uh, pretty sweet. Oh no, wait. Encump Live is the hashtag for the show. Um, <laughs> little abbreviation for Encompass Live. Um, I'll, while I'm on the archive page here, you can search for any other topics you might be interested in. If there's anything you're wondering we did a show on, go ahead and do a search there. Uh, show topics presenter names, whatever. Um, do be aware when you are searching this, if you're searching the full show archives and not just the most recent 12 months, we do have that filter here. Uh, this is the show archives for going back to the very beginning of Encompass Live. We premiered in January 2009. So wow. that's a lot. <laughs> I know. I can't believe it. And we're still going strong. Um, and everything is here. As long as we have a place to host all of our recordings, uh, that's what libraries do. We keep things for historical purposes oftentimes. Um, and right now, everything is available there on YouTube. But just pay attention to the original broadcast dates. Some shows will still be good, will stand the test of time, still be good, valid info. But some things will become old, outdated. Um, information, resources will have changed drastically. Um, some links may no longer exist. Uh, resources might not exist anymore. Uh, people may work at different libraries now. So um, just pay attention to that original broadcast date if you are watching any of our uh, previous shows. And this is our upcoming shows. Uh, next week's show, we're still working on um, getting a confirmation on that. So keep an eye on the schedule, see what we have there. But then you do see you have our other shows coming up. We've got uh, January all fully booked. Um, Sally Snyder, our Children's and Youth Services Librarian, doing her usual summer reading program session on the 21st, and then her best new teen reads on um, in January. She did her best children's reads of 2022. There we go, just a couple weeks ago. So those of you who look always look for those shows, um, you can watch those. So that wraps up for Encompass Live. I just want to do one last plug for, um, along with our weekly Encompass Live show here at the Nebraska Library Commission. We also host the annual Big Talk from Small Libraries online conference. Um, this is a conference that's held on the last Friday of February every year. And all of the presenters are from uh, libraries that have a population served or an FTE of 10,000 or less. So small libraries talking about what they are doing. Um, and the call for speakers is open right now. So. Um, if you are a small library or you know of a small library who's doing something cool, uh, go ahead and tell them to submit the proposal. The deadline is next Friday, December 16th, um, to get your proposal in, and then um, we will 
should have a schedule together. And the conference will be Friday, February 24th, it's fully online using the same GoToWebinar software we're using here today. So do please um, please do spread the word about that. You can see all of our previous conferences over here as well if you want to see what has been done before or what the conference is like going back to our first one in 2012. Where am I? There we go. <laughs> all right. So that wraps it up for today. Thank you everybody for being here. Thanks, Laura and Linda. Good luck. Thank you. Um, and hopefully we'll see all of you on a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye.